Lord, it's really good to be back here with uh, Dion and Lynn and family and with all these friends, and we pray that tonight you will again just pour out your blessings. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, so, several years ago, I had a dream, and as I say, I always journal my dreams. And uh, my journal, I'll just uh, show it to you. This is just two years of journaling here, and I have to hold it together with a rubber band. But I trust that you're aware that this is the word of the Lord. You know, as an Episcopalian, uh, and I don't attend uh, church uh, very often at all, but I certainly enjoyed the liturgy and the Eucharist and the rest of it uh, when I do. And uh, they have some wonderful uh, phrases, the word of the Lord, and the response is, thanks be to God. But when so many people think of the word of the Lord, they think of it as this, bound between leather covers, black ink on India paper. But it so happens, and thank God for this wonderful book that I've spent an awful lot of time in over my whole lifetime, memorized a large portion of it, read it through three times a year, all the way from Genesis to Revelation in my earlier years, year after year after year. So I'm quite familiar with it, and it's part of me. But I'm always appalled at the way Christians have not over 2,000 years picked up the fact that God says, and uh, my friend Herman Riffle one time when we were on the staff of a large charismatic church in Florida held his Bible up one night as wonder they didn't burn him at the stake, but they didn't, said, this is not the word of God. Now, he got away with it. If I had done it, they would have burned me at the stake. <laughs> but uh, I said to Herman afterward, that's new orthodoxy, Herman. And he says, I know it. <laughs> But in any case, it's uh, by the usual standards of evangelical Christians heresy, but it isn't heresy. Because this book says, the letter kills. This is the letter. And if you're only stuck in this, then you're going to have a very dead experience with God. And he's going to be very distant, like living out billions of light years in space, someplace called the New Jerusalem, at the Father's right hand, or... Back down the quarter of time, 2,000 years, it's Jesus and his Jewish body. But you know, Jesus hasn't operated on this planet for 2,000 years now through that Jewish body. Uh, he disappeared a long time back, and he said, it's good for you that I disappear, didn't he? Because if I don't go, then the Comforter can't come, whom I'll send to you from the Father. But when the Comforter comes, I and the Father will come too, and we'll make our permanent abode in you. So Christ is here tonight in flesh, and we're it. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, Jesus finished his work, but he did not finish your work, and he did not finish my work. Jesus could say, I have finished the work that you gave me to do, and on the cross it is finished, but he didn't finish your work. And that's why Paul, who certainly had a great grasp on this and was... Certainly one of the great mystics of all times, and I have this book in one hand tonight and a science book in the other hand here and some others. And Paul said at the end of his life, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, but before he got to the end of his life, he said in Colossians 1.24, I am filling up what is lacking in my flesh, I am filling up what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake. So his work wasn't done until he got to the end of his trail. I hope I can say, and I believe I'll be able to say by the grace of God, I have finished my work. Each one of us have work to do because we are the word of God incarnate. We are Christ in flesh now. Christ in you. Paul says, this is the doctrine I preach, Christ in you, Colossians 1.27. Not Christ in a Jewish body, not Christ living under a steepled building, but Christ in you, the hope of glory, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom so that I can present every man mature in Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which works in me mightily. 
So are you in touch with the Christ who's in you? Can you hear God speak? Have you developed the capacity to pick up deep intuitions of the heart, deep feeling judgments? It's kind of pathetic sometimes to see that God has to do an end run on pastors and priests and take a man like Carl Jung who says there's an ongoing program of God in this age. Now here's one of the founders of modern psychotherapy and he says that program is the crucifixion of many. That's exactly what Paul taught, Christ in you. And he says, uh, all things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew he predestinated to be conformed to the image of Christ so that Jesus could be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. So here we are, and we he has multiplied himself in us, except a grain of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone, but if it dies, it brings forth much fruit, and we're it. We are the Word of God incarnate here. And that's why the Bible says, do not say who will ascend into heaven to find the Word. Or to send into the depths to bring him up again from the dead. Why not? Because he's near you. How near? In your mouth and in your heart. Where is the Word of God tonight? Not black ink on India paper between leather covers. This tells us, I will put my law in your mind and I'll write it in your heart. And when God sends you a special dream, that's the word of the Lord for you. And that's why we ought to spiral around until we can pick up the central motifs of our life. It puts a tremendous foundation on you and it's an anchor for your soul, sure and steadfast within the veil. God intended to keep on speaking. That's why he said, don't say who will ascend into heaven. It's near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. Romans uh, chapter 10, the word of faith that we preach. Now, years ago when I was having, uh, and I still do, but uh, having a particularly bad time and having many fights with God, and uh, anybody who walks with God uh, closely will have that kind of an encounter. You'll find yourself in some arguments, and the, the arguments really count. Many times more than you'll ever imagine. But I was having some arguments with God, and at the time he gave me a dream. And my, my uh, line of argument was this. Now look here, because he's giving us a bad time. I've served you faithfully over these years, and I've been out there and taken a lot of flak, and a lot of heavy artillery shells, and all the rest of it, and the machine gun fire, and the front lines as a gunfighter, and as a prophet, and as a troublemaker, and yet... You have failed to meet these needs, and, and I would enumerate the things, and, and uh, my argument was not based on the grace of God. It was, I deserve this, ante up. <laughs> <laughs> so God gave me a dream in which I was back on my old college campus, which was an ultra-conservative fundamentalist Baptist college, and a place that I would not necessarily visit in three dimensions these days. But in the dream, I was back on that campus, and it was a magnificent campus, a very beautiful place, very well-appointed grounds and all that. But I was running around looking for a fight with the fundamentalists that were there. And I couldn't find anybody to fight with, but especially I was looking for the registrar because I wanted my credits. I wanted a transcript, and uh, which, of course, is telling you plenty, isn't it? That's what I'd been arguing. If God, give me my credits here. Give me my transcript. And... Uh, I couldn't find any, but I couldn't find the registrar, so I finally ended up, now imagine this, in a class that I hated in college and seminary, worse than any other class I was forced to take it. What class was that? Missions. Because if there's one thing I never wanted to be, he was a missionary. But in our evangelical circles, it was a badge, a credential of honor and glory to be a missionary, and especially to be a missionary to Africa. You had to be a missionary to Africa to be the very best uh, uh, in standing. They had churches, of course, that numbered 20,000 and more over there at the time, but we were still sending missionaries and the rest of it, see? So I ended up in missionary class where I didn't want to be, and uh, here were a bunch of young people dressed in uh, ties and shirts and nice dresses, and they looked nice and neat, and I wanted to pick a fight with them. 
being much more of a liberal mindset than they were, and they wouldn't fight with me. They were very kind to me in the dream. And uh, <clears throat> they said, have a seat. And I said, I'm looking for the registrar, and I want my credits. I want a transcript. They said, well, have a seat. Old Wald will fix you right up. Now, it took my good uh, wife, Nancy, to tell me right off who old Walt was, somebody who's blessed me a whole lot in my life, and that's my friend, Dr. Walter Leckler, the German psychiatrist, who uh, is a, one of the greatest Christ figures that I've ever met and a very healing person. But he knows how to deal with guys like me and also like you. That's why I suggest you come to Hilton Head and enjoy that conference in uh, 1998. And so I sat down in the seat, not being able to do much else, and it became kind of a ultra-modern, almost like an amusement park, multimedia event. And lights began to flash, very pleasant-looking ones out across the campus, and the whole room began to swing and sway, and it was in a marvelous rhythm. And first your seat would be elevated, like it would be an amusement park on certain rides, you know, and you'd be way up high looking out over the campus and then you'd be down low looking at something else that was fascinating and you were getting a very panoramic view in this rhythmic movement in this classroom. Now, note, I was in a class I didn't like. God was telling me, you don't like this class I've got you in. <laughs> but you're in rhythm and just sit down. Sit. Sit and rest. Quit fighting. Sit and listen. That's a very difficult thing to do when you're upset and angry. But I got greatly blessed by that dream, and I did. But the wonderful thing was, at the end of the dream, these young people in the class began to sing a beautiful chorus, which when I awoke, I could not remember, but God gave it back to me with a vengeance a few hours later. And they started to sing this song, Out of the sin in the world comes music, and out of the sin in the world comes beauty. Now that is a marvelous piece of work, and I couldn't remember the tune or the words, and a few hours later God just gave it back to me, and I remember both the tune and the words, and I sing it to this day. Out of the sin in the world comes music, and out of the sin in the world comes beauty. Now, we live here in three dimensions, and many times, I'll hang on to this one, many times... Uh, <clears throat> It seems like we're living on the wrong side of an embroidery down here. You ever look at a, an embroidered pattern from underneath? It's chaos, isn't it, when you look at it from underneath? The pattern's up above. And in order to see it, you've got to look down from the top side. And I remember how chaotic those colorful patterns were that my mother and grandmother used to do when they were doing embroidery. And when you look down from the other side, you see an entirely different picture. Now, this is what the New Testament advises us repeatedly to do, and this is the genius of the New Testament. In fact, the other night I had occasion for the first time in a long time to recommend a book that I don't have opportunity to recommend too often because I'm dealing with a different type of Christian today and uh, at a different level in their spiritual growth. But a fine young man came up to me, or early middle age anyway, anybody's young to me <laughs> these days, but he came up and I could tell where he was in my spirit and he asked me, he said, all the wonderful books you recommend, he said, I wonder what one I should read. Well, the Spirit of God told me none of them. And I just knew where he was in his spiritual growth and he was back down the uh, path quite a ways, but he loved God and he was advancing and he was just coming to the place where he needed to be introduced to something that to the average, like himself, traditional Christian can be rather radical at that stage of development either, even. And that is this, that universally, almost without exception, our churches moralize and teach us to do the best we can to be good little Christianettes, to toe the mark, to abstain from the dirty dozen, to walk the line, and so on which is not anything different from any of the world's religions. That is not Christianity. It never was and it never will be. It's warmed over Judaism and it's utterly destructive. And the Bible says repeatedly, the law works wrath, strengthens sin, and multiplies transgression. And those are all direct quotes from Scripture. And yet, the institutional church, by and large, has never learned that. 
And this fellow was a product of the institutional church. So I said, yes, there is a book that you should get. And it's by a great Chinese Christian watchman, Ni. And you should get one on Ephesians called Sit, Walk, Stand. It's a little book, but you'll love it. Because the order is entirely reversed in that book from what you usually hear traditionally. Watchman Nee had a great grasp given by the revelation of the living God that when God wants to make good Christians, he does not moralize over them. He does not tell them to walk the line, toe the mark, and the rest of it. He spends three chapters, the first three chapters in the greatest letter in the New Testament, Ephesians, in getting Christians to sit down and rest in what's already been accomplished for them. He takes them to the upper side of the embroidery and he shows them an entirely different radical pattern that you would never pick up when you're living in this body in three dimensions down here. We need to be elevated to the place where we can get God's view of things and stop living down here in the nasty now and now on the wrong side of the embroidery. So he spends three chapters getting people to sit down. Now this book you know, was written 2,000 years ago when Paul did this in Ephesians. And uh, he says in Ephesians 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father. And by the way, it, he's so excited about it and enthusiastic about it. I'm always amused with this. He spends only two verses greeting the Ephesian church in the first chapter. He just says, uh, uh, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and God bless you, brothers and sisters. Now let's get down to brass tacks. And in verse 3 he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has already blessed us. Please note, past tense, it's done. Like Hebrews 4, 3, the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Before there was a planet to stand on, before there were spinning balls in space, before there were countless billions of light years covered with all kinds of cosmic systems, before the foundation of the world, you were blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, and chosen in Christ to be holy and without blame before him. In love, he set your destiny beforehand to be like Jesus Christ. That's why there is therefore now no condemnation at all to those that are in Christ Jesus, past, present, or future, we are king's kids, and God holds nothing against us but his love. And we're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You, tonight, and you might look back over your checkered experience like I do mine on this planet, and feel unworthy to sit on the best seat in the universe, our Father's throne. But as a matter of fact, the Bible flat out says we are seated in that place and blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Ephesians 2, 6, and 7 says, He has already raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now this is something entirely different than your head will tell you. This takes revelation. And Watchman E was very good on that. And I won't go into all that tonight because I don't have time. But in any case, that's why Paul prays in the first chapter. You won't be able to think this thing through, so he prays for you and he prays for himself. And we pray this often for one another, I'm sure, Ephesians 1, God give unto us the spirit of wisdom. Now he's talking to Christians, obviously, and this is after he's talking about all these blessings he's given us. So when he gets down to verses 17 to 19, he says, give unto us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the continuing, unfolding, progressive knowledge of Christ, epigenosis in the Greek. Give us the spirit to con continue to unfold these riches that are in Christ. The eyes of our heart. I have eyes in your head tonight that are good for three dimensions, but they're not good for beyond three dimensions. In fact, I've got a, I love to carry a little uh, <coughs> stereographic book here with me, stereograms. This one uh, is uh, called, what is it, Magic Eye. And there are many of them out. In fact, I'll pass it around if you want to stare at them a while. Now, there are hidden patterns that you don't see with your three-dimensional eye until you relax. You've got to quit being uptight. Maybe put the thing on the end of your nose and draw it away slowly. Or look cross-eyed through it. But there are wonderful hidden patterns all through the book. God has hidden patterns. 
which we cannot see with the eyes of our body, which we can see with the eyes of our heart. It's the upper side of the embroidery. If we get up there and we have the eyes of the Spirit, and that's why Paul prays, God give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the continuing knowledge of yourself, the eyes of their heart being enlightened so that they can know the hope of their calling, the glorious riches of your inheritance in them, because we are God's inheritance. And then this, verse 19 of Ephesians 1, the exceeding greatness of your power in them according to the working of your mighty power. Way back in the early part of my ministry, I looked up that verse in the Greek. One little verse, that they might know the exceeding greatness of your power in them, according to the working of your mighty power. I looked that up in the Greek. There are four different Greek words in that tiny little verse to describe the power of God in us. One is the word dunamis, that dynamite comes from. Another word, kretos, that uh, omnipotence comes from. And there are a couple others that over the years I've forgotten. But in any case, four Greek words to describe God's power, which is available to us. But, you know, Jesus said, I must go away, because he said, if I do, then greater works than these shall ye do, because I do go to my Father. He's not operating as a Jew through his Jewish body. He's operating through your body and mine. And only now, because spiritual evolution, like all evolution, takes a long time, do we begin to realize that there's a better way to fight this battle, and there's an immense amount of power available to us. I tell you, at this stage of life, I'm more excited and enthusiastic about what's happening and what God has given us than I have been in 46 years of ministry. I was ordained clear back in 1950. And that's why I'm traveling around with enthusiasm tonight doing these things. And there are people who are really biting into them. And things are happening. And we haven't even begun to scratch the surface. But we've got to get on the other side of the embroidery. Now remember that all that I've presented to you so far is in this book. And it's been in there for 2,000 years. And not only, of course, in Ephesians, it's all through the book. For example... Uh, I was singing today while I was walking around the parking lot to myself in the hotel where I am, and I go out and walk for an hour and have a great time with God and do my affirmative prayer and the rest of it and just have a fantastic time. And I was singing an old hymn, which has always been one of my favorites, and maybe you know it. Come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing call forth songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Here's the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. O oh, to grace how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave thy God I love. Here's my heart. O oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. What's that? Out of the sin in the world comes music. Out of the sin in the world comes beauty. Tune my heart to sing that kind of a tune. God said, sit down. Just like Watchman Nee wrote, sit, walk, stand. Quit fighting. Quit arguing with me about what you deserve and what your credentials are. I sent many people to, uh, to you to tell you, great is your reward. But he says, that's not where the action is. Sit down and relax and get in rhythm and start looking at what's around you and listen to the music. Out of the sin in the world comes music. Out of the sin in the world comes beauty. Now, an old lady who died back in 1956 wrote one of my all-time favorite books that I frequently recommend, Key to Yourself by Venice Bloodworth, who was a union analyst way back in the 50s. And died back there when I about the days that I was in seminary. But this is as fresh, and you could open it to most any place, and you see I have, like all my good books, marked it heavily. And uh, this dear old lady really had some great stuff. And this is one, I'm just going to use a short one because I don't want to labor on this, but uh, uh, I've got something to show you here, very important in just a moment. But You've heard me include this in some of the tapes, I'm sure, that if the conditions are unsatisfactory, build new conditions in your mind, ignore the present surroundings, 
and hold fast to your middle picture. That's a great piece of advice. If the present circumstances are unsatisfactory, build new conditions in your mind. Ignore present circumstances and hold fast to your middle picture. She's saying dream. You know, when it came to Paul Young E. Joe, who built the world's largest church, and uh, you can't even keep up with how many hundreds of thousands he has in it over there in Seoul, Korea anymore, but when they wrote his biography, they called it Dream Your Way to Success because he's teaching the same thing she is. You know, we get down here under the embroidery and we're looking for our credentials and we're running around looking for a fight and the rest of it like I was in my dream. And we struggle. And boy, through this last winter, we had our struggles and plenty of them. But you know, everywhere there's great hunger. Tremendous hunger. Just like there was 2,000 years ago. And you don't find it all in the existing institution, the church, any more than you did in Judaism 2,000 years ago. There are people who are hungry for the living God. And this is an age of flood change. George Leonard in his great book, The Transformation, was right. This is an age of flood change. You can have a part in it. We can change our lives. And we can enter into our riches. And we can begin to tap into the fact that we are blessed. What good does it do us if we don't tap into them, blessed with all heavenly bl uh, blessings and heavenly places in Christ? Now, throughout the New Testament, he says, since you've been raised up together with Christ in Colossians, and I love William's translation best on this, it says in King James, seek those things which are above. Much better translation, practice occupying your minds with things above, not with things on the earth, because you've already died, and your life is hid with Christ and God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, we'll appear with him in glory. It says in Hebrews, you are already come to the Mount Zion, the city of the living God. That means that while I'm seated here in the body tonight in one local place in three dimensions, there are all kinds of levels spiritually, right out to El Elyon, the Most High God, and I can live in heavenly places in Christ, having boldness to enter into the very holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he's opened for us, through the veil, that is to say his flesh, he ripped up the embroidery pattern from the bottom and gave us an opening to get up and see the top. Through the veil of his flesh, having boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he's opened for us, through the veil, that is to say his flesh. I don't have to live down here in three dimensions tonight. I don't have to be running around looking for my credentials and looking for a fight. I do often, but I'm learning to do better. Because this is particle town down here. This is where energy manifests as particles at high energy. And they bomb off one another. And you know that when you ride in the Garden State Parkway and so on. <laughs> and the New Jersey Turnpike. But there's a better place to live above where energy manifests as waves. You never get patterns down here, it looks like chaos. But if you can get upstairs, you can begin to see the pattern from the top side down, that's where energy manifests as waves. And then you have a top level where somebody's orchestrating the whole thing. Now guess who preached this? Paul did, but who else preached it? Venice Bloodwork did as a mystic. Who else preached? Many, many mystics do. Deepak Chopra uh, preaches it. But you know who else preaches it? David Bohm. Now, who is David Bohm? One of the world's great theoretical physicists who worked with Einstein. David Bohm says this. Down here, you have the explicate order. This is the explicate order. This is the unfolding area. This is where things come out of the invisible realm and they unfold. And it seems like there's time and space. You know, Richard Bach wrote a great little book on this, on, on the underside and the next level up, and he called it Illusions, and it was a bestseller. I strongly urge you to read it. Just before I took off, I left it in my official reading room out there, but I was halfway through it for the eighth time in my life in the last many years. Illusions by Richard Bach. 
What, now, what these physicists tell us and what scientists tell us and the mystifying, marvelous thing about it is that when I was in college, almost to the last man, these guys were atheists and agnostics and said, this is reality down here in three dimensions. There is no pie in the sky by and by. There is no invisible realm. Now they, all those on the cutting edge and the avant-garde, tell us exactly the opposite. All of this stuff is illusions. It's something that we have projected. We have built the world around us in three dimensions. It's a consensual reality. And it isn't real. It is real to us, but it's not real scientifically. The reality is the invisible. 2,000 years ago, Paul wrote, our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory while we look not at the things which are seen, but get on the top side and look at the things which are not seen. Because the things which are seen are only for time and space. The things which are not seen are eternal. So here's David Bohm saying on that next level, down here you have the explicate order. You get upstairs and start looking at the embroidery, and I'm using my own analogy here, of course, but he says, you're looking at the implicate order. He said, now that would be a, an area much like where all the potential music that could be played is stored in the implicate order, in that area where energy manifests as waves. But he says, if you get up to the third level, he said, that's the super implicate order. Now, you see, all these physicists, almost without exception, believe in levels. Of course, that's what the Word of God teaches about God's image. Seeing we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, is the proper translation, through all these levels, and is seated at God the Father's right hand. So there are levels in the image of God. So the physicists tell us there are levels. There's the explicate order down here, which is the nasty now and now, the underside of the embroidery, where you're looking for a fight and the rest of it. You get upstairs in the invisible realm. You get on the top side of the embroidery, you begin to see hidden patterns. And that's the implicate order. And you get on higher, it's the super implicate order. That's a physicist teaching that stuff. Imagine, we have boldness to enter into the super implicate order having boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, we can enter right into the very inner sanctum of God himself. <clears throat> now think about that. That can change your life. I'm going to read you a couple things from Bridging Science and Spirit by Friedman. I'll show you how God works. This is one of my all-time favorite books on theoretical physics, uh, The New Science, Quantum Mechanics. Uh, I had many of them, and I look at them frequently. But you know, I was on a plane, on coming, I think it was going back from one of my itineraries out here in the east. And I've mentioned this on another tape, but I was sitting next to a really big fellow, and I'll tell you, I don't care whether it's Delta Airlines, and I guess the others are just as bad, I usually fly Delta. But you have to rub yourself with vinegar and alum to fit anywhere near into those seats anymore because you should appear as a shrunken midget if you want to enjoy your flight. And it's just a, a disgrace alongside of the earlier days of flying when it was so much more comfortable. But in any case, I'm sitting, and usually I get a window seat, which is my preference, and I get my reservations early enough to do that. And I'm grateful that I get it most of the time. This time I didn't get it on one of those big L-1011s, and I got seated in an aisle seat with this big fellow. And I mean, he was much bigger than I am, beside me, and he couldn't do anything but lean on me, so he pushed me out in the aisle, so I got hit by carts when the <laughs> flight attendants went by and everything else, and it didn't do my disposition too much good, I'll tell you that, after, after a busy itinerary back here. <clears throat> but in any case, uh, finally got all calmed down and everything, and I was reading and studying, he says, my, you're really enjoying your studies, aren't you? I said, yes, I am. I, he says, what are you studying? I said, I'm looking at quantum mechanics here as a layperson and really enjoying the uh, mystery and the spirit of uh, the new science. And the guy lit up like a Christmas tree. Now, we'd ridden together for quite a while and hadn't spoken, which often happens, you know, but he said, well, I am a physicist from Idaho Falls. 
And he said, I just find these things so fascinating and so miraculous. He said, have you read Bridging Science and Spirit by Norman Friedman? Mm -hmm. And I said, no, I haven't. So I wrote it down. I said, I'll get it. Well, the, about the next time I uh, heard from anybody, it was a very dear friend of mine, Kathy, uh, who has blessed me, just been sensitive to God and blessed me with exactly the right book. I can't tell you how many times she's given me gift books, and she sent me the very book that the physicist recommended. And I sit here tonight with it in my hand. So it's a great experience. Now, it puts some miracles in your life, and it puts some color in your life. And uh, I want to read a couple of things about uh, upstairs. By definition, the implicate order is holistic and undivided. Therefore, any connections in this order are independent of locality in space and time. Now, this is what physicists are finding out. No time and space upstairs. Only down here. It's an illusion. Our three sources share this fundamental notion that events do not happen, they just are. Our sense of time and change comes from the unfolding of these events. Unfolding of them. The past has been unfolded, the future is yet to be unfolded, but in the implicate order, all events are in the present. That means that if you're blessed with all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ Jesus, everything is set out there like a banquet table in the implicate order, and God wants you to claim your blessings, and you can do it. Because here's another scientific fact. The particles that make up our body, our being, these scientists tell us, are only here for a uh, split second, microseconds. Where are the particles of those energies otherwise? They're in other parts of the universe and other universes. That's what the physicists believe, in parallel universes. They believe that your parts are appearing simultaneously otherwhere, other places in the universe. That we're not only here, we seem to be confined totally to this body of time and space. But if we had sense perception adequate to pick up the real reality, which we don't, and that's what makes, and this is a mystery of course, that's what makes our reality very real to us. I'm not going to try even though scientifically you should be able to walk out through the door tonight without opening it. I'm not going to try that. But that's what they tell you, see. Now, the thing is that we do want to increasingly learn how to pick up in images, metaphors, and similes, as Werner Heisenberg said, flashes of eternity. And that's what the New Testament's all about. He says... The Spirit wants to give us insights into these things. We are much greater than the person confined here to this body. I used to draw three circles on the board when I was illustrating body, soul, and spirit, and make the body the big outer circle, and then soul a smaller inner concentric circle, and then spirit the smallest inner circle. And God told me one time way back, he said, that's dead wrong. He said, invert the whole thing. And so I did. You're in spirit, you reach out to infinity. You're, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. His spirit bears witness with our spirit. We're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And then the soul is the next inner circle, and then the body as we sit here tonight is the smallest representation, confined in this body to time and space. But that's the way our sense perception picks it up. And this has helped people, yes, Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. So, <clears throat> that is, uh, you can pick up these messages that God has for us from these other dimensions. And that's what it is to be seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's what it is to ask the Holy Spirit to start showing you, hey, I want to unfold some new things. Like last night I was talking to Nancy, my wife on the phone, and it has been a rotten winter for everybody. You know, I hear from a lot of people, my correspondents and on the phone, and then I meet them when I come out like this. 
I haven't heard one person that had a good time last winter. It was a bad time. But you know what these fellows say, and uh, go on to tell us this, that we can not only change the future, but we can change the past. And uh, he says this, since the present is all there in the implicate order, our past and our future are constantly being created through the free choices of individual consciousness involved. I don't understand that very fully at all. I confess that to you tonight. But I said to Nancy, what do you think he means by that? I said, because nobody had a good word for last winter. I said, I'd like to change the past. She said, well, you're out there telling that and you're showing people how to change the past. And in fact, if what we went through along with our brothers and sisters, and I'll tell you, when you get into these realms, then you feel the oneness, no matter how many miles separate you. Then perhaps people will begin to find the goal that was hidden there all the while, if we can find the goal that was hidden there. And I thought she had a real good insight on that. I want to know more about how to change the past as well as the future. Venice Bloodworth says, hey, if present circumstances are unsatisfactory, build new conditions in your mind. Ignore present circumstances and hold fast to your picture. And I tell people that's a great piece of advice, and it truly is. But it's very difficult, in, like last winter, when you've got your head and a vice and a blowtorch on your rear end. That's very difficult to ignore present circumstances. But you know, Nancy picked up a statement that I've written in the front of this book by a great Greek uh, mystic, Katzenzakis, and he said this, I believe in a world which does not exist, but by believing in it, I create it. We call non-existent whatever we have not desired with sufficient strength. I believe that's absolutely true. Now he goes on in this thing to say this, in your system of reality you're learning what mental energy is and how to use it. You do this by constantly transforming your thoughts and emotions into physical form. You're supposed to get a clear picture of your inner development by perceiving the exterior development. What seems to be a perception or an objective concrete event independent from you is instead the materialization of your own inner emotions, energy, and mental environment. And we can change things. That's something to really ponder. That's something to really think about. And he goes on with a paragraph from a couple of uh, good mystical writers, and he says this, Ken Wilbur defines the purpose of this project as the self, and that's a good psychological term for the Christ, ascending the ladder of consciousness in order to produce even higher unities. They which receive abundance of grace, Romans chapter 5. And where is the throne of grace? In the super implicate order, to use the analogy. They which receive abundance of grace can learn to reign in life through the Lord Jesus. I want to know more about that. Listen, Christ's work will not get done down here while Christians sit, or, sit around and twiddle their thumb waiting for the second coming. We're the body. And we're one with him in spirit. And we're here to finish our work. He finished his work. We're here to fill up what's lacking in Christ's sufferings for his body. We're here to be the conduits and the channels of blessing so that out of our inner being will flow rivers of living water. We are the body of Christ and joined to him in one spirit. We need to learn how to do some of these things. Now, with that in mind, Nancy had a great dream back in 88 that I've referred to often right after my first wife, Trudy, died. And I think very immediately afterward, and it was one of the greatest dreams that I've ever heard because I'm still working on it all these years later. And the dream was more for me than it was for her. And she was one that was used greatly uh, in uh, Trudy's life and her last days. And they were very, very dear friends and very close. 
But in this dream, we were in a, like a public garden with beautiful foliage and, uh, you know, it'd be like Longwood Gardens or someplace like that where everything was beautifully planned. And there was a long table. And I won't go into all the details, but there was a man in the dream who had just lost his wife and he wasn't able to handle any of this. And of course, that symbolized myself at the time. But Nancy had a diagram. And they sat down at a long table. And on her left sat a Christ figure who was represented by my old friend, Dr. Francis Whiting, who went home to be with the Lord uh, a couple years ago at 78 years of age. And he was a Christ figure. But in the dream, she knew that that was Christ. And they were pondering this diagram. And some of our favorite people were around that long table, almost like the Last Supper. One of them was Mark Brady, who uh, spoke at our last conference, who's one of my favorite spiritual sons, and certainly has a brilliant mind, a great spirit, and loves the Lord. And he expounded at some length on what he thought the diagram that Nancy had meant, but didn't shed much light on it, very frankly. Because it's not something that a younger man, that's what symbolized in the dream, would have the insight into. But Francis sat there with a look on his face as a Christ figure saying, what do you think the answer to this is? Nancy was looking at something that in the diagram had a heavy line drawn. And underneath the line were three factors. Chaos, pain, and suffering. Those three words in the dream on that diagram. Chaos, pain, and suffering. Believe me, that's the underside of the embroidery. That's this three-dimensional world of high-energy particles where you don't see many patterns. Above the line, there were two things revealed. Hearing from God and separation, which means sorting and that kind of thing. And the other two weren't revealed which means that there were seven factors in all. There were three below the line and four above the line. Seven, all together. And Nancy said the answer to it is, I think, because everyone around that table is trying to solve the problem, get this, of the 12. What's the 12? That's multiplied power. That's discipleship. Power multiplied, like through the 12, that's why it's like a Last Supper, say through 12 apostles. How do you get maximum power out of this kind of a situation when you've got the nasty now and now downstairs here in the underside of the embroidery in chaos, pain, and suffering, which describes an awful lot of the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune down here, as Shakespeare put it. How do you deal with that? What dreams can tell you is fantastic. Nancy had the right idea. You invert it. And Francis smiled magnificently in full approval on that solution. You invert it. You turn it over and you look at it from the top side. You get where you can see it from a different light. And you get up there, first of all, hearing from God. And of course the Bible says over and over again, today if you'll hear his voice. Man, we do not need millions of Christians sitting in hundreds of thousands of churches and synagogues and the rest of it every weekend listening in that setting we need millions of Christians or at least thousands or hundreds of thousands as the group grows who can hear in the real temple you are the temple of the living God and I put my law in your mind and I've written it in your heart and any one of us can ask God to turn up the house lights and we can learn how to dream and invert it and live on a higher level today says four times in Hebrews 3 and 4. Today, it's written to Christians, right now, if you'll hear his voice, harden not your heart. And if you practice the presence of God, as Brother Lawrence did in his great experience as a monk back in the Middle Ages, and Paul advises us in Colossians 3, practice occupying, practice occupying your minds with things above. That's why I'm walking through the parking lot this morning singing hymns and talking to God and having a great time. Practice occupying your minds with things above, not with things on the earth, because you've already died. What's that do to you? Well, go on down through the verses of Colossians 3, it says, that puts on the new man. 
That puts on the new man. That's the upstairs man. That's the implicate order man. That's the spirit. Put on the new man, get this, which is continually in process of being renewed after the image of him that created him. And you can get higher still because your life is hid with Christ and God. That's the super implicate order. That's where the conductor is that chooses the music off the second level. And then out of the sin in the world comes music. And out of the sin in the world comes beauty. When you start and you're in sync at a higher level and your spirit is joined to Christ and his spirit bears witness with your spirit, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the mature sons of God. And that's exactly what it says in the Greek. It doesn't say as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they're the children of God, like King James. It says, huioi, which means mature sons. Romans 8, 14, as many as are led by the Spirit of God. Can you hear the Spirit of God? Can you feel Him in a deep psychic intuition in your spirit? Can you feel that sense of current? I love it when a uh, physicist like John Hitchcock in the University of Wisconsin says, listen, if you get quiet, just relax. Otherwise, you'll never pick up the patterns. But if you get quiet enough, you can pick up the ripples of the patterning. That's a quote directly from Dr. Hitchcock. You have a tympanic membrane in your heart that resonates to God. And you can invert that order. And you can, yes, and many times we have to, vent when we're down here under the underside of the embroidery and everything else. If you don't, you can't possibly ever get quiet enough to see the pattern. That's why James <laughs> taught some good stuff. I'm not particularly fond of James. Martin Luther didn't like his epistle and called it epistle of straw. And uh, Dr. Gene Scott calls, uh, calls him James the Jerk. I don't know whether he ever knew that or not. But in any case, he said some good things. And he says, and sometimes we have to do this. When our, when our head's in a vice and the bull torch is on our rear end, he says, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and get this, purify your hearts. What's the rule upstairs? Blessed are the pure in heart. They'll see God. Yes, you've got ears, you've got eyes in your spirit. You'll see and hear God. Blessed are the pure in heart. But you know, if you're loaded with all kinds of static from the underside of the embroidery, you can't hear God or see God. And sometimes you have to do some scream therapy. That's what James advised. Cleanse your hands, and he's writing to Christians, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you schizoids. Be afflicted. That's a modern term, but that's what he said. Be afflicted, and mourn, and howl, and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning, and your joy into heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he'll lift you up. You know, when I first saw formal scream therapy back in 1976 at Princeton, when we were doing work with people on the mats, and Dr. Leckler was there, and then with Dan Casriel, one of the fathers of screen therapy, I recognized that for nine years prior to that, I had done it spontaneously. I had discovered how beneficial it was, and I used to take off from, it must be time to quit. Uh, I used to take off from, uh, from my... Uh, place in uh, northern Vermont and drive 75 miles to Sherbrooke, Quebec and have lunch. But I was really hurting bad when I did that because those were very trying days. And I'd be hollering and yelling and screaming and crying many times all the way to Sherbrooke. And then I'd have a good lunch and then on the way back I was very quiet and peaceful and I could hear God speak. Do what you have to down here, but get upstairs. Invert it. And after, you know, when you're in that corner, never put yourself down for that. Just remember that Elijah was totally suicidal after one of his greatest victories and just took off and hid in a cave. And he was, the Bible flat out says he was suicidal. And why wouldn't he be? I mean, he'd, exp he'd been a channel for expending tremendous energy to brought about uh, massive change. And when you are a channel for that, you're going to find yourself more fatigued than you've ever been in your life, along with the depression that often comes with that. So hiding in a cave, how does God appear to him? <coughs> Roars at him, you know, out of a storm, and lightning flashes, and all the rest of it, and thunder and everything else, and a great wind, a mighty wind, which can be very scary. And then finally, at the end of it, a still small voice. We have to get through all the storms. 
hide out until you get through the storm's and then you'll hear the still small voice. But for pity's sake, get upstairs and hear from God. Chaos, pain, and suffering, invert it. Hear from God. Then you start sorting things out. And you sit and sort. And you sit and sort some more. And you journal. You have a way you do this in your own inimitable style. But you sit and sort. What's sitting and sorting? It's the feminine mode which is absolutely essential and particularly for men to rediscover. And thank God they are rediscovering it today. You know how we want to control everything and operate everything and run everything. And that's especially our inheritance from a very macho age. But I use this statement again and again from Matt Fox that I have written in the front of my testament. We must get rid of the God of control and enter a more feminine God and trust process, birthing, and new life. That's what God himself did back in the beginning. It doesn't say in the beginning. It says in his head God created the heavens and the earth. I don't want to go into all of that tonight. Bereshit, in his head God created the heavens and the earth. And then Merahaphit, in a feminine fashion he brooded. He was pregnant with creation and he incubated on the face of the waters. Sit and sort. That's the next thing above the line. You hear from God, and then you sit and sort, and you sit with God. You take time in whatever fashion. You can sit with God when you're driving down the Garden State, or walking through a parking lot, or sitting in a restaurant. It's a wonderful thing. And if you do, patterns start emerging. It's like sitting and looking at a stereogram. And you relax, and something you didn't see before pops out at you terrifically. Fred Allen Wolf, the great physicist, calls that quiff popping. The pattern pops, and you know, man, that's the thing for me to do. But you have to spend time with God and live with God. Not strain and struggle to pray and be on your knees and all that stuff, and I'm not talking about any of that, and you know it. I'm talking about living with a living God. Well, when that happens, all kinds of good things start popping. And the other two weren't revealed back there in 88. And I waited on God a long time before they were revealed, and then they got revealed to me through a mystic from the 16th century, a great mystic, Jacob Burma, Jacob Bohm, most of us would call him, who had fantastic visions and influences men to this hour. And guess what kind of men beside the Church of Christ and, and people who really love God that he influences? I found out the other two Numbers 6 and 7 in that dream that were not revealed to Nancy in the dream. By reading a book years later called Science, Meaning, and Evolution by Basarab Nicolescu, a French physicist who based his whole book and his interpretation on, of modern physics, quantum mechanics, on that 16th century mystic's visions. That's very fascinating stuff. Numbers 6 and 7, you have chaos, pain, and suffering below the line, hearing from God, and uh, separation, which were revealed, and number seven and eight were rising, joy, music, and song, and number seven, not number seven and eight, number six and seven, the last one was the birth of God, God born in a new image. That's why I called this series The New Science and the new image of God. Back in 85, I had a great dream where a bunch of singing happy people were building a very uh, avant-garde type of work of art, a big massive thing made of jack jagged rocks, but I knew that the jagged rocks that we were building as we were singing and happy was the new face of God. Remember, we never have anything but an image. And God is showing his new face to those who have a heart for him today. And we're builders. And if we get upstairs and invert it, we can take the things that are exist in an eternal now, and we can change future, present, and past by, if you don't like present circumstances, build new conditions in your mind, in your heart, in your spirit. Ignore present circumstances. Hold fast to your picture. Do you know what this is called? It's the way of faith. 
Faith is the substance of things we hope for and conviction, evidence, proof, reality of things that we don't see. And by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which we see were not made of things that appear. They were made out of invisible things. And by this, the elders obtained a good report. So you can call on them for help when you're living upstairs because you've come to the Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn written in heaven, to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. And when you're living upstairs, you can call on your friends to help you. That's absolutely true. You know how? Because everything, as Rupert Sheldrake has so beautifully discovered, is a field, a memory field, a spiritual field. And you and I live in a great spiritual field called God, or the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. And while we seem to be separate down here, we are joined in oneness there. And we are one. And when one of us learns a new trick, and those who've gone on before, and that's what ritual is, that helps you to recall how they did it. That's why it's good to go through the liturgy and the rest of it. When you put something new in the hopper, you're starting to change things. And when it reaches critical mass, things can change like that. And all of a sudden there's a new thing, and it happens without a crusade, and it happens without a war, and it happens without all kinds of politicizing. It happens out of the other dimensions. That's a great way to live. Rupert Sheldrake tells the story in a wonderful videotape that my younger son who teaches philosophy at Providence College sent me for my birthday. About a little bird called a blue tit in London. Back before the Second World War, and you know how they used to deliver milk bottles with caps on them. And the bird, one bird one day, an enterprising bird, learned a new trick. He learned how to pick the cap off and get the cream. I love this illustration. And it wasn't any time before a whole bunch of those little blue tits were doing the same thing there in London. Then it spread all over England rather immediately, and then it hopped the channel you know the Netherlands and France and other areas where this bird uh, was prevalent. How did that happen? Not because they got on a uh, British Broadcasting Company or something to send a message across the channel, but because they belonged to a morphogenetic field. And the message went out through that spiritual field, and they learned a new trick. And Rupert Sheldrake goes on to prove magnificently, certainly to my satisfaction, the satisfaction of his interviewer and many other people. In fact, the fellow who was doing the interview called him a Darwin and an Einstein rolled into one in our age. And proved this fact that, for example, if... There's a very difficult crossword puzzle published in the London Times at night. It's much easier because people work that crossword puzzle all day long to work it the day after than it is the day before, before thousands of people have done it. We live in morphogenetic fields and we learn new tricks from one another. You're very important. It's very important that you fill up your skin and become everything that God made you to be. And that's not a strain and a struggle, that's a resting in an unfolding pattern. You have a very special place in the body of Christ that nobody else can fill. And if no two fingerprints are the same, and no two snowflakes are the same, and yet all snowflakes have a six-sided pattern that they magnificently fulfill, believe me, God's done much better by us. And you have Christ in you, and that's your morphogenetic field. And if you get in touch with it, and, uh, you know, we keep it up, 
someday we'll, one of us will be the hundredth monkey and the whole thing will change. Just like the collapse of communism. There's great power upstairs. Spend a lot of time up there. That's what I want to share with you tonight.